Please stand. They shall grow old, they shall grow, not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we shall remember them. Please be seated. We come to this place from various walks of life. Our connection with those who have sacrificed for our country are varied. 
Some of you have friends or parents, loved ones who have served, and others, no one. That is our culture today. So we are so far removed from the sacrifice and the work of our military personnel. And so it's appropriate that we take this time to remember and to hope. I invite you to sing with me our first hymn, God as with silent hearts. We're very fortunate today to have with us Doug Morrison, an RCAF vet who flew 39 missions over Europe, and Earl Smith, a longtime member of the Royal Canadian Dragoons. And we thank them for coming, and we would like to give them a round of applause for coming. The Remembrance Day service at McDougall were originally planned by the late Ian Huggs Fowler, a longtime member of the church, a flight lieutenant in the RCAF in World War II and a prisoner of war, by Reg Munden, an active member of McDougall and the choir with a lengthy military career as a member of the Royal Canadian Dragoons and the Lord Strathcona Horse by George Hogg, a squadron leader in the RCAF in World War II and a keen member of the congregation of McDougall. George introduced a candle, which we light every Sunday, to pray for the support of the men and women of the Canadian services, including our first responders. George died this year he was 96 years old. Will you pray with me? God of all, open our hearts, open our minds, open our memories. Amen. We're in the midst of a series on what the church is, and it just so happened that this week it was the church as the kingdom of God. Uh, we did think about, because it's our remembrance service, not continuing with the series, just, you know, putting it on next week, but it seemed so appropriate to talk about the kingdom of God when we talk about Remembrance Day. Um, I don't know if you heard in that video, it was talking about churches aren't uh, measured by how good looking their ministers are or if they wear skinny jeans. <laughs> and all I can say is amen. Because <laughs> that wouldn't be good. <laughs> Peace is not the absence of war. That's what he was saying. It is the presence of shalom. It's a powerful statement on this Remembrance Sunday. Because when we think of our military personnel who have faithfully served, we are inevitably drawn to war. Because war is where the stories of valor and heroic feats are brought into the clearest relief. We stage it as a battle between good and evil and the conquering of foes and the sacrifice of loved ones in a just cause. These are the images that come to mind when we take our moment of silence and we remember. And that's a good thing to do. Because our governments have asked our military to engage their best selves in the most dangerous of occupations, defense of a country and its ideals. And if sometimes the causes are muddled and the directions are unclear, this is not the fault of the soldiers on the ground or the airmen in the sky. Their sacrifice is always 
sacred, even if their missions are not. This preoccupation with war leads to this idea that peace is defined against this suffering. It's the absence of war we say that is the true sign of peace. But as Soon Chan Ra, the man in the video, says, this is not how peace should be described. True peace, as he says, is the presence of shalom. And according to Wikipedia, shalom means peace and harmony, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, welfare and tranquility. And it means hello and goodbye. This is so much broader than peace as the absence of war. And it doesn't refer to war at all. But this juxtaposition of shalom and peace at the, as the absence of war is at the heart of Jesus and his ministry. On the coins in the first century were stamped these words, first victory, then peace. It was the slogan of the empire that sought to control the world. They put down uprisings and revolutions with an iron fist, indifferent to the suffering of the people. It was their belief that peace was only possible when Rome was victorious. And that's the definition of peace as an absence of war. This is the might makes right mentality of a superpower. And it's not foreign to us in this age because the sable rattling continues and military dominance is a race in which many countries are engaged. And I was actually thinking as I was sitting there singing our hymns, um, it just struck me, maybe because Tony was sitting next to me, and we were talking about all the people who've come here and built this great country, and we fought so hard uh, for our country, and it just struck me that that uh, war or that occupation that involved our indigenous people um, is forgotten so often. It's that definition, sacrifice is always sacred. Sometimes missions are muddled. According to John Dominic Crossan, who's a first century scholar, not a scholar from the first century, but a scholar who studies the first century, just to be clear. <laughs> Jesus taught us a different way. Jesus slogan, if you will, was first justice and then peace. And he defined peace holistically. He said peace is the kingdom of God, not of Caesar. The kingdom that is present now, that is here with us. And we can choose to participate in God's justice, God's shalom. Even while wars rage, even while sabers rattle, and even while governments posture and threaten. Because God's justice is distributive instead of retributive, two big words. But distributive means it's about sharing all of God's resources because all we have in Hebrew thinking comes from God. And everything, this earth, is a sacred gift for all humanity. And God's justice is not swift and vicious. And it is not punishing for taking what I want. And it's not a war that demands you step back and bow to my strength. Justice, God's shalom demands the fair and equitable distribution of God's blessings on the earth. Candace Chuel Hodge writes about Crossan's work and she puts it this way. I think that we, if we actually believe that God owns the world, 
then wars and rumors of wars would end. If we truly believe that God's justice is distributive and not retributive, then peace would inevitably follow because we would understand our role in the kingdom of God. We would understand that life is about mutuality, not about how can I keep mine and get yours. And that's why our scriptures today are so important. Our Hebrew scripture points to a time when God's justice becomes the norm, where people come to the mountain of God to learn how to live in peace. And those swords become plowshares and the spears become pruning hooks. And in the midst of occupation and exile of the Hebrew people, this is the hope that keeps them alive. It's an eternal hope. And it persists through Hebrew faith into the first century where the writer of the Revelation imagines a shalom that is bigger than history. A new heaven and a new earth where God is with God's people in a bright and shining city where there is no more war, where God wipes away the tears, and where God's shalom permeates all. And so we, the church, carry that hope. We, the church, try to live in God's shalom now. We, the church, reject the normalcy of might makes right and what's yours should be mine. Instead, in our flawed but faithful way, we remind each other that the peace of Christ flows through our veins and through this place. And we remember that God's justice is not vicious and punishing. It is whole and loving and equitable. And we, the church, live in hope that one day we will get it. That as brave and honorable and faithful as our military personnel are, and we are so grateful for them and for their sacrifices that continue. In that day, the tanks and the bombs and the artillery and the drones will cease. This surely must be our prayer. Amen. I stood by as his plane touched down The infantryman on the foreign shore Coming on back to his hometown And it seems so long Since he's been gone I stand before him now When I gaze in disbelief My boy came home from the war today Draped in the maple leaf My boy came home from the war today With a medal for valor in combat They hoisted him high on their shoulders and every man gathered there clutched his hat but no fanfare played and no speeches were made and no pretty young maids waved a handkerchief my boy came home from the war today draped in the maple leaf
My boy came home from the war today. He was draped in the maple leaf. My boy came home from the war today. Now my heart is filled with grief.